Hi there, I'm Jay Comfrey. You're listening to High Performance, the podcast that delves into the minds of some of the most successful athletes, visionaries, entrepreneurs and artists on the planet and aims to unlock the very secrets to their success. As ever, I'm not alone. Our resident professor and author Damien Hughes is with us. And Damien, some, sometimes we speak to sporting stars. Other times we speak to entrepreneurs who've done amazing things. It's rare for us to get the chance to speak to somebody who's nailed both of those things, both of which are incredibly hard to do. Yeah, and I think the one word summary of what I'm really interested in exploring today, Jake, is the term commitment. You know, this is somebody that's been committed in two dynamic, fast-moving industries and been successful in both, so I'm really excited about it. Unbelievable. Were you thirsty? No. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. So, sorry, do you want me to just do that last bit? Yeah. So I'm really excited to, uh, to find out more. Right, let's do it then. Let's meet today's guest. And he did something very few young lads with a dream around him would have managed. He made his Manchester City first team debut as a teenager. He then played for seven clubs over the next few years. But for him, it wasn't all about the game. He was building a fashion brand, which has become a multi-million pound success story worn by some famous faces. And he is absolutely the driving force of that. Um, I follow him on Twitter. It gives me inspiration, actually, just by seeing the things he puts out there. Um, he is the man that runs Manier Devoir. He was a professional footballer. He's the epitome of a young, self-made success story. Reese Wabara, welcome to High Performance. Thank you for having me. It's <laughs> nice to have you with us. So, look, let's start, as we always do. What is High Performance? Um, I think High Performance is, is obviously the 1% of the 1%. Um, and I think... What really defines high performance is consistency and how long you can maintain uh, that reign at the top, so to speak. Um, it's almost a, a no-excuse mindset, um, full accountability. Um, and yeah, just consistency. You know, you've got to do the same things over and over again and uh, in the hope of obviously achieving the wildest dreams. But I was actually speaking to a friend yesterday and the, the theory is pretty simple um, but very hard to execute and it's just a case of setting your plan, setting what you want to achieve, uh, researching who's the best in the industry and find a way to almost emulate and add your stamp on that and obviously with the aims of being even better than the, the, the person that is the best at the current moment. Um, and you've just got to wake up every day and make sure that whatever you set out to do, you do. Um, and like I said, be consistent with it. Um, I think a lot of people and uh, my generation and millennials, when they don't get immediate success, they give up um, because obviously with social media and whatnot now, it's like there's so many, well, they appear to be so many instant successes, but um, I think there's a saying that says it takes, um, well, there's an overnight success. It took me 10 years to do so. And I think that's the, that's the problem um, in, in today's world now. Um, even myself, I think people look at my current, where, where I live or the, the cars I have or whatever and think, oh, that happened overnight. But... That's been seven years every day, non-stop, um, you know, analysing data, researching, um, obviously in the fashion world, uh, seeing what trends are come in and going, etc. So um, high performance is, yes, yeah, sticking to your task every day and, and getting the work done. But so you're talking there about your successful mindset and you, and you referred quite a few times to most people think this or most people think that. And you're totally right in that. But where does this come from for you? Where did this mindset develop or this understanding of you know something we've seen from quite a few successful people where immediately you say oh, I spoke to my mate we broke down exactly where we want to go and how we're going to get there and then you just simply follow the process like that is a very difficult thing for a lot of people to even understand let alone execute so where did where did this develop from um, when I was around 23 I started reading like very extensively and um, what I noticed is a pattern emerging with several of the books and all of the, the people who, or the authors of the books have typically achieved good things, whether that's been an author or, or in different backgrounds. And they all kind of alluded to the same process and mindset. Um, and effectively, if you could write the key points of all of those books, they, they all practically say the same thing. So reading definitely helped me. What were they? Like, how do you summarise those now in your head, those points that the book wrote down? Um, you've got to think really big. Um, you can't make excuses. Uh, you have to hold yourself accountable for everything that happens, more so on the bad side because success is also shared, whereas failures is normally you've just got to take it, take it on the chin and hold it for yourself. Um, I'm trying to think what else there is. 
Yeah, mostly those those three points. So, what I like though about that, and Damien, we've spoken about this so many times. Really, what Reese is talking about there is one hundred percent responsibility. Don't have any excuses. Don't pass the buck to anybody. Yeah, and that's the thing that's come out at, at, in all of the interviews that we've done, Reese, with high performers. Has been this idea of it might not be your fault, but it's your responsibility to fix it and and to make the best of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, everything can't be 100% your fault, but if you're a leader and you hire someone and they don't do the job correctly, that's still your fault because you hired the person. Sure. Or you could have put in steps or processes to help that person not make that error. So um, when, when in, in my business, if people make errors, of, first of all, I look at myself and go, how could I have helped that person do their job better? And then obviously I try and fix that. I guess after you know three or four times, you've got to you know say, okay, well, maybe it's not the yeah. right person, but... There's always things you can do in your daily life to make sure that you don't fail, or if you do fail, you can break that that down systematically, and there's probably a reason why failures sure. happened. See, what intrigued me, Reese, when I was reading about your career to date was that your success as a footballer makes you unique. There's that statistic that uh, less than half a percent of kids that set off on a journey will become a professional. So you succeeded there, and then you've gone into a fast-moving, dynamic, competitive world of fashion and you succeed in there. Do you think having those two options helped or hindered you in each of those careers, both as a footballer and a business leader? Um, in, in Football education as a business leader definitely helped me because there's, you have to be so resilient in football. There's constant rejection um, and, and obviously that rejection eventually become numb to it. Um, you obviously... Well, fortunately, I was at Man City and I was around really high-performance people at the top of their game. So just watching how they operated on a daily can only... I could take nuggets from them and understand, well, that's what you have to do, no matter, like, whether it's Aguero or David Silva, they're always doing the same thing every single day, no matter that success. And um, I wish I would have learned those skills maybe earlier in my career and or had the intelligence to analyse it and observe it, because I only look back in hindsight and realise, oh, that person was so consistent and never changed in terms of their, uh, their output and input towards their craft. And I was probably a little naive and uh, maybe not intelligent enough to spot those signs early on, but it definitely um, aided me in business. I guess the business actually hindered me in football because um, when I was playing, obviously the business was... I was 22 when I started, and I think at the time I'd just left Man City, um, and I think I went to Doncaster initially... Um, and then, and I think after a year or so, the business was doing quite successful for a, for a startup. And, you know, in that football sphere, there was a lot of people wearing it. There was a lot of friends of the footballers wearing it. So in that world, it was seen quite a lot, to be honest. And obviously social media was on the uprise and the reach of everything was astronomically more than it is now. So it was like in everyone's faces, so to speak. And um, when you've got managers who are quite dated and... Uh, old school and they see a young boy and I was always rather flamboyant probably too flamboyant for the level I was at but that was just my personality I've always been that way and I didn't really want to change but when you've got someone driving a nice car um, young and has a business straight away those dots connect and someone goes he's not interested in football he just wants to have that lifestyle so um, fortunately, I managed, I managed to slowly progress from Doncaster, and then I went to Barnsley. I think I then moved from Barnsley to Wigan within six months. And then, obviously, we won the league with Wigan, and I was in Team of the Year. Then I got released. So, obviously, being in Team of the Year and being released was uh, the rumours I heard about why I was released, because obviously no one could attribute it to my on-pitch performances. It was insane. But I just sat down with the manager at the end of the season. He said, I don't think you're focused on football, which... My obviously response was, the numbers aren't lying here. So, what's the issue? And that that um, kind of disheartened me, to be fair. And I didn't. I stopped playing for almost a year. And then, I, obviously, to stop doing something you've done since a kid is, uh, for the first six months, I was like probably a little bit bitter. So I was like, whatever, I don't want to play. And then you know, the next six months I was like, okay, I'm thinking about getting back into football. And that's when I went to Bolton. But a year out of the game, is, and I think it was like uh, middle of the season and I had to pick up the slack was quite quite difficult. And I only started finding my fitness towards the the end of the season and I was in good form as well, which obviously led to their promotion. So, And then I just decided to completely stop because 
Um, the business was doing really well. Um, I know focus is super important and doing both is... I remember my dad saying, it's easy to do both. I'm like, yeah, you would say that. <laughs> but obviously to be, to be high performance in two rounds, I don't think it's... It's obviously possible, but it's extremely difficult um, because, you know, there's only one person and to have your mind in two headspaces, one in business mm. with staff and lots of moving parts and then one in football when you've got to travel, you know... I never switched off. It was like, okay, Monday to Friday, I'd go to training, go into the office. Then I'd be like, oh, I'm tired from, I'm mentally tired from business. I've got a game tomorrow. Then I'm in recovery for Sunday. So, um, of course, everything's possible, but I, I think I was 25 at the time, I'm 28 now, or 26, I can't remember. Um, and I just had to make a choice. What's most long-term? Where can I be the best of the best in? And unfortunately, at the time, I mean, it was possible for me to play in the Premier League, and I think that would have been likely. But to be a Champions League World Cup winning footballer was very low percentage. So I just had to make the logical choice, and that was to continue with the business and hopefully take that to the heights it could hit. So when you look back on it now, do you wish you'd have maybe make a, made that choice sooner to have left football behind? Um... Not necessarily because um, uh, I think I needed to get out of my head first. I needed to know that, okay, I've left, I came back. It wasn't, and, I, and at that point I really, obviously I, I wanted to um, give everything my all and I did and I worked really hard. And, um, but there was too many barriers, too many ceilings to break down and, I and I'm all for breaking down ce ceilings but not when I, if I don't need to, I won't, there's no point. So I just needed to kind of get uh, that I'm not going to be a footballer in my head no more and uh, uh, kind of that mental just break completely and then focus on business. So I think the timing was right. Uh, the business was, I think, three years old at that point. Um, so obviously it's, it's, it's gaining stability come from the, the startup phase and uh, it's probably the perfect timing to be fair in hindsight. But look, a bit of luck in the time, and I guess. I mentioned at the beginning that I follow you on Twitter, and I think your tweets are fascinating. You know, you are very open about finance and things. You will share how much money Manio Devoir is turning over each month. Looks massively successful. Images of cars. There's like an image of a plane and a nice car with, and you've put the logo on. I mean, that that's either your plane or that's the ambition, Which. right? <laughs> but the, but you're making it very very clear to anyone that follows you quite overtly, this is the ambition. I want to go to the top and I'm on my way and I'm happy to share the whole journey with you. So I want, I want to know how much of that is about you proving the people that couldn't deal with you in football wrong. How much is that fire left over from football and you're saying, yeah, you know what? You thought that this wouldn't happen or you thought I wasn't good enough or whatever. Have a look at how I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think the fire's from football. I think that... that Past, I think people knew the business was successful towards my end of you know leaving, but that the the fire will always remain, and if the fire's not there, I have to fuel the fire, and that's that's how I operate. Because if no one's criticising me or down to me, I don't think I can operate at my highest level. Um, I think complacency kills massively, and I think it's almost a trick to my own subconscious that I need someone to kind of say I can't so do who it. Who are you speaking to? Then? Are you putting that out there? so that people maybe come back at you and go, oh, whatever, and then you use that as the fire? Or is, when you put those tweets out, who's in your head? Like, or what yeah. is in your head? So when I, I, when I, I've only started to do that recently, and what I, the reason why I did that most, mostly is because um, I don't really do any interviews or press, or I don't, I don't obviously a lot of businesses use mm. press um, outlets to showcase their success and whatnot. And I've never done that, and I've done that always because obviously those, those numbers are, well, those when you're doing those articles, they're for your ego, really, to say, oh, they're doing well. And because I didn't, haven't done that for so long, I, I heard through the, like, I can hear whispers through the grapevine, like, oh, is, does it, is MDV even successful? But obviously, you can just go on company's house and do your research. But most people don't do that. They only see what they see on social media and take that at face value. So I was almost becoming my own news outlet to showcase, OK, well, you're talking, you've seen all these, these articles and other businesses, but... These other businesses, not to say they're not better or worse than MDV, but they're different. Like MDV is privately owned. There's no investment. Um, and I kind of break down those figures to make people stop comparing myself or the brand to others. And of course, there's businesses even better than MDV. But just, to, just as a case of to be my kind of my own, what's the word? Um, just to let people know about having to go to the social, uh, the, the media outlets media. and whatnot. 
Um, and as you said, then also to kind of invite some criticism. Because um, like I said, some people uh, crumble from that stuff. And for me, it kind of... My friends would tell you, if anybody doubts me or anyone beats me in anything, I'll make sure that the next time you won't. That's just how I, how I operate. Not to say like I'm a super competitive person and I must win everything. It's just the kind of like, if someone beats me at chess or whatever, I'm like, okay, good game. You did well. Then I'll go away in my spare time and make sure that when we play again, they don't win. Um, that's just the way I am as a person. And uh, yeah, I think losing fuels me. And I always say losing is the best thing in the world. And I'm like a, I'm a graceful loser because I know the next time I won't. That's just how I've always been. I wish I, like I said, when I was younger, I wish I could think how I think now, but hindsight's a wonderful thing. And if I would have had the same mentality I do at, say, 26, when I was 19, I'm sure I'd be, you know, higher up in the, in the football world than I finished, basically. But um, everything happens for a reason. And I'm glad I kind of missed that opportunity of uh, obviously Man City, England and mm -hmm. very highly regarded and again I was complacent, that's the bottom line. I always worked hard but I didn't do more, I could have always done more. So I think that kind of, uh, not regret because again I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that but I know if I could live life again I would be playing Champions League or Premier League now. Um, so so I don't... You, let, let me get that clear, you are saying the mindset you now have if you had this mindset 10 years ago, you know you'd be at the very, very top. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, so it's, 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 it's just one of those things. But um, at the same time, uh, if I didn't have, like I said, if I didn't have that failure or that slight regret, I wouldn't have been able to achieve at the level I'm at now. So it, it works in roundabouts. See, but I think that you're a real inspiration for a lot of young people that, that aspire for the lifestyle that you have and, 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 and all the success that you've achieved, Reese. Do you think it would be helpful for them to see the struggle as opposed to the outcome? You know, like the idea of a lot of kids love the bling and, and, and the idea of going to the fancy parties, but what you're saying is the real success stories are those that love the struggle the the grind the staying behind when nobody else is there do you think that that would be a powerful message for you to share yeah um, and i think the problem of social media is now everyone shows the the outcome i think if people have followed me I, i've got like quite a as much as it's not a huge audience it's a very like interactive audience they engage with everything i say and i think that's because i've showed the hard struggle throughout and now when I show the cars, for example, I don't really receive too much uh, jealousy or hate because I think people have seen that, oh, he's been doing this for six years every single day. So like, even though typically if someone was just to show a car, they'd be like, fuck off, basically. But in this situation, if you, like I said, if you're one of my core um, audience, you're like, oh, you know what? He's been hustling, grinding every single day. He deserves, that's the outcome. And I make that clear as well. I'm like, okay, well, these things don't mean anything, but... These are just a byproduct of you seeking excellence. And um, as I said about seeking failure, etc., I actually say to my staff, when things are going too well, it means we're not, you know, we're not doing enough. I expect things to break at least every two years. And when I say break, I mean almost catastrophic, like, you know, lose a lot of money type of break. Um, we're probably going to feature that this year because the warehouse is at full capacity. So we've got to switch to warehouse and I'm sure there's going to be some inefficiencies there. But I feel like, yeah, I actually look forward to things breaking because it, it shows that there's a new realm of growth um, left in store. I think if you get to a point and you feel like you're, it's too easy or, uh, you know, it's not breaking enough, you need to probably have a think of, yeah. you know, what's next? Is this career for me? Or if you're content, that's great too because not everyone's... Um, built or even likes kind of always growing so can I ask you about your dad because he intrigues me when I was reading some of the stuff around and you meant reference to he had this idea of well you can be successful in both and, yeah. and sort of instilled that can do mentality in you yeah. and he seemed an important figure in your football career yeah would yeah, you definitely. tell us a bit about his influence? Uh, he's um, he's an intelligent guy. Um, I always say, like, I'm, obviously, he's, he's done okay in life. I mean, he's, you know, he's got a decent job. But I always say I'm what he could have been because he's very intelligent, um, but he's very lethargic. And uh, he, he always does the bare minimum to keep him at that level, which obviously is, is great. And he's a very content person, so he's very happy, and that's the main thing. But uh, I'm kind of like his natural intelligence or... 
like he sees things quite clearly like he can connect dots quite well and I kind of had that work rate or desire and consistency to to really go to the next level so he's a definitely an important figure in my life he's a, he's um very calm relaxed and like I said he sees things with clarity so um if I ever need to speak to someone which is quite rare but he's always got like a, a good um outlook on, on the situation even though he might not be within the fashion world he's he can observe what's going on and because uh, that's the key that we were interested in in terms of who who is your mentor now that he obviously seemed to do that when you were in the world of football but who mentors you now that you're in a completely new world of, of fashion no one to be honest um because of the the level the business is at and the way the business is um Structured, like I said, it's it's privately owned and there's no investors. So typically, yeah, we should reach you know twenty something million in sales this year, and in and typically in those circumstances, you'd have an investment or you'd have a CEO, and it's still those things are still me. So f- to ask for advice from people who are in like almost the new world of an e-commerce brand, which is only what, five ten years old. Uh, you've got the boohoo's of this world who are obviously publicly traded, huge businesses and way bigger than MDV, which and a completely different model. They sell cheaper volume clothes who are slightly more expensive, um, slightly less volume based. So there's no actual um, business model which I can, you know, pick nuggets with. My is my um, mentor is reading or observing. You know, I observe failures more so than successes because most of the failures they follow the same pattern, whereas everyone's success is slightly different. So I just avoid traps. I say, okay, well, this person's done this, this person's done this, and they both struggle from it. So what's the, what's the big trap that, that, that you've observed other companies have fallen into? Complacency always. Um, you know, letting your product become lackluster is always the biggest flaw. Um, running before you can walk. Um, people try and chase growth figures or revenue figures, which is pure vanity, um, without really focusing on the bottom line. Uh, going to wholesale is a, is a problem too, because you obviously have the payment terms issues, where you know typically they're paying 90 to 120 days, but you've fronted the stock immediately, so that creates cash flow, uh, cash flow issues. And um, selling to people, selling part of your business to people who don't understand your vision and just see it as a cash cow. So, again, I've not done any of those things yet. Um, there might be a possibility of some of those things, albeit in different circumstances to how other people have done it. Um, but, yeah, I just spot traps, and that's probably the biggest advice I could give anyone is, like, don't watch what other people are doing in terms of when they look successful. Um, you can admire their approach, but unless you want to emulate their business, which is also a bad idea, just emulate their approach, but spot people's failures, and that will kind of give you a path to... You know, a, a decent kind of incline. And you, you speak about the fashion industry with <clears throat> such a mature head and it sounds like you have such a clear path of where you see MDV going and what the plan is. Are you saying that without a mentor, all of this has really come from listening, reading, watching other people? Because if that is what how you've done it, then really this is open to anyone, isn't it? If you have the right mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Being observant is the key. Um, yeah, I always say I'm a very normal person, but I just I just observe more um, and obviously consistency and dedication. So I always say on my you know Instagram and social, read this book. But how many people read it? Like I'll read a book, write notes, read the notes several times, or read the same book several times just to take it in because you can't take anything in first time unless you've got an, an elite elite brain, which yeah. I don't think I do. So um, yeah, everyone can do what I've done. Um, I, th- I hear people say, oh, well, you had football startup money, but people forget that. At Barnsley, I was on pay as you play. At Wigan, I was there for six months. So it wasn't like I earned millions, you know what I mean? Uh, I started the brand with 15,000, which I do appreciate is more than most, but I think you don't need that much. What you need to do is buy a product which is exceptional and flip, basically. You know, you buy something for five pounds, sell it for 20 pounds, and it's a simple process and make sure that when you obviously accumulate the money, you, you don't... Um, spend it frivolously but yeah absolutely I think what I've done is open to everybody there's no shadow of a doubt it's just a case of like I said being disciplined consistent have a path spot the traps that other people are doing have your own identity and understand as well if if that's not your natural calling don't force it I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs my age and younger or whatever age I guess 
they will see that someone's an entrepreneur and they seem to be making money and it looks cool and kind of force themselves down that avenue which isn't meant for them like I always loved fashion like I was wearing things which people when I was at Man City it was like what's this guy wearing to train and like I shouldn't have wore it but that was me you know that's my personality so that was my natural call and I had a natural understanding without having to work too hard to, to, to kind of get it into my head so but then I see people trying to do fashion and it's not their natural calling, it just looks cool. So I'd say like, if you want to be an entrepreneur or be anything, don't do it because you see someone else being successful from it. Do it because it's your natural understanding or you seem to get things that people don't then run down it. Otherwise, just stay in your... And we haven't field. even sort of broached the topic of bravery either. I think to do anything... You know, I think to run out on a football field in a Man City shirt when you're still a teenager in the first team with some of the names you've mentioned, that takes bravery. But it's a different kind of bravery to go and set up a fashion label when you knew that the football industry was going to be snobby and sniffy about it because for some reason football loves to put footballers in a box, right? And if you do anything outside that box, we see it all the time in the media. Any footballer with any interest, apart from playing football, it's used as a stick to beat them with when they, when they struggle as a player, right? Absolutely. Which for a start is a mindset that needs to be changed. But also one thing that I love hearing from you is the bravery to go and do this at a time when you, when you knew that was going to come your way. And I think so many people listening to this podcast, either young guys in their late teens like you were when you had this idea, or people in their mid to late 50s who've always wanted to do something and have always used an excuse as to why they haven't. The one thing is just to do it, to be brave and to, to just go for it, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's fear is what holds the majority of the world back. It's the, scare, it's, it's the, it's the, um, the fear of people laughing at you if it doesn't work or your parents saying I told you so or all of those types of things. And I guess when I started the brand, I was just left Man City, as I said, and I went to Doncaster, took a huge pay cut. I still had two cars and lived in the city centre. So the, the money I was earning was literally just maintaining, you know, everything that I had. And I had nothing to lose. It was like, I said to myself, well, you've got two choices. You get back to the Premier League or this business goes to the top. Obviously, I was trying to do both simultaneously. But I knew that if I failed, all of that stuff goes. And that's obviously going to hurt and anyone's ego, especially a male ego, if I was to lose the cars, which I like, or the lifestyle that I was having. So for me, I was just like, well, I've got no choice. You either succeed or you fail and I didn't actually care if I failed in the sense of like I could deal with like like I said before rejection is a common thing in football so I could deal with that and I knew that at some point in my life I would be successful again so I have that same mentality today like I will take risks that most people won't because I don't care about me failing obviously I care about my staff and their well-being but if I was to lose it all tomorrow I know in three years I'd have it all back so I think that's the difference um, I love the self-belief, don't you? Yeah, I do. It's brilliant. But I'm intrigued as to that move from Manchester City to Doncaster, with due respect to both clubs there, must have felt like a failure yeah. that, that, that you'd set off to achieve a, a first-team spot at Manchester City and now you're there. How important was that quite public failure in, in, in that, in terms of then stripping you of that ego and giving you that 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 courage not to fear yeah it was a reality check um and you had to look at the facts and that was that was a decline and there was no way two ways about it so um yeah you know like I said that's a huge public you've gone from England Man City debut to Doncaster in League One I think it was um so it was it was definitely a failure and um, again, it was just another failure to the. It's like a, you, you're a punch back when you're a footballer. So um, eventually, you become numb to it. And you, but what do you mean by that, Riz? Because looking from the outside in, again, we've not seen the struggle. So it looks like you had a, an unchecked path of success. Of you've gone to Manchester City, you've made the first team, you've got yeah. national representative honours. What were the failures that you described before that? Um, I guess. Whilst I was at Man City, I had the one opportunity, but there was other players who wasn't, I guess it's, it's biased for me to say as good as me, but they was having more opportunities. But again, I don't blame the club at all because if I look back with, again, a more mature eyes, as I said, if you were 19, you're driving cars, the hearing that you go to the clubs, you're hearing about women, why would you give this youngster more opportunities? Obviously, his, his mind's not in the right place. And I completely understand in terms of ability, I was 
you know, one of the best in my age group. Um, and I think Trippier actually said something recently, like he was the reason he left, I was the reason he left. And obviously he's a fantastic footballer and done great things, but he was, he was obviously in a different headspace to me. He was more determined. That was his sole focus. He wasn't with cars, clothes and women. And, he, and, and that's why he's successful in, in, you know, playing for Atletico Madrid now. So, um, yeah, I think there was a lot of doors closed on me, but it was probably... I'm not, I wouldn't change anything, but it was my own fault because I didn't play the game in order to let those doors be open. I was kind of like, I always said to myself, and I remember saying to myself as a, as a teenager, as long as I do my thing on the pitch, all of this stuff doesn't matter, which is true, that theory is true, but football's not that simple, it's a political game. And obviously that was a, um, a blind spot that I didn't have at that time. I own son now, as a 28 year old, but um, it's a political game, so I should have played the game more so. So how would you deal with a teenage version of you now if they came to join your business? In terms of? So if you had a young boy coming in that you could see had obvious talent yeah. and was maybe making sales and really adding value to the business, but th- there was a question marks about their commitment or how focused they were. How so, would you deal with you? So I have people like that in the business, actually, and um, I encourage their flamboyancy because that was what people tried to strip out from me. But sometimes it's a case of putting the arm around, which people didn't do to me and say, look, I understand you're young. I've been there to, you know, go out and drink, but not on a Sunday. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, don't come into work and let other people who are more older than you and senior look at you and go, oh, well, Reese is letting him act that way. So it's just the case of, you know, don't try and drive that flamboyancy or, you know, their natural character out of them because that's what football does to a lot of people. But you've just got to, you know, just give them a little bit of advice and pat on the back. When I was at Man City, and I remember I was, I think I bought an X6, then I had a C63, then I had a Panamera, which is insane for a 19, 20 year old. It's like stupid. Why, why would you do that? I would never advise someone to do that. But I remember at the time the senior players were loving me. They were just like, oh, yeah, you know, that car's wicked or keep, keep doing that. And then I think to myself, when now I'm old, I'm like, why would you not tell me not to do that? And that part of me thinks to me, were they really my friend? Do you know what I mean? Because if I saw someone doing that at 19 years old with the world at their feet, I would say, look, hold, park that for a little bit. Just focus and you can get that in the future. So that reminds me of uh, Warren Joyce, who was the reserve team coach at Manchester United, used to make that very point to the young players there that he'd say, when the senior players are inviting you to come into the jacuzzi after training and they're not doing it because they like your company, they're doing it because they're eradicating you as a threat to them. Correct. Yeah, that's absolutely it. So um, I still speak to some of the lads and obviously I don't bring, I don't bring up that stuff because it's in the past, but I do think to myself, you didn't look after me like you should have. Well, or I thought if I was in your position with identifying someone's t- talent, I would want to nurture them to make sure they maximise it. But I think you're right. I think it was a case of like, let's let this young boy dig his grave. Um, and I did. So it's, it's my fault. It's a message though, I think, Reese, for football this, because it's kind of okay for you. Because, as you've just said, you're looking at sales of 20 million plus for MDV this year. But there are lots of young people, similar age to you now, who did have that, did make the same mistakes, and are now daily regretting it because they are having to graft in a job they don't like and they're seeing their former teammates on the telly representing England and things. So there is a message here, I think, for football, isn't there, that they need to look after young players better. There needs to be more guidance But also, I think along with that, there has to be an acceptance that everyone's an individual. And if you have someone who's an individual like you, then if you can get the best out of them, football's a better place for it. Like I would say when you speak to Reese and the the, the business head he has on him, Damien, and the the drive and the ambition and single-minded determination, of, of course it's come now because he's a bit older and it always does. But... I would sense that football would be a better, more rounded industry if someone like Reese was in it. Very much, yeah. Because talent wasn't an excuse for you, was it? It was you had the talent, so it's all the controllable aspects of work ethic, commitment, individuality is what you're describing, wasn't particularly nurtured. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Obviously, when I was growing up, like I said, social media wasn't that prominent and then you had Facebook and that was like you know it wasn't as public as Instagram is now and the pressures of being a, a young footballer then was like you know have have a nice decent pair of trainers and maybe maybe a little Gucci belt or bag and now I look and you know obviously the the teenagers are earning much more than I did when I was a teenager naturally because of inflation but the pressures for them now is having a £50,000 watch and 
you know, a Range Rover at 19 and, and a big house and 600 pound t-shirts, like the pressure's real. And if you don't have that, I can understand as a teenage uh, boy that you feel inadequate. And I think, you know, senior football managers need to also understand that pressure because uh, I felt as a kid, and like I said, it's been amplified now. So um, I don't ever judge these kids because like I said, I was that kid once, but um, you know, you, you've all been, when you've got young boys with diamonds around their neck, it's you're asking for trouble, to be honest, and uh, that's obviously a huge distraction, as, as I as I learned. Remember, you weren't broken by it, right? In mm-hmm. some ways, you were made by it, but there's lots of people that were broken by it, and that's <clears throat> that's the issue. You know, the, those are the people that you have to maybe think about, I think. Yeah, I mean, I played with a lot of those people who, you know, don't who no longer play mm-hmm. or play at a level level, who were highly talented, and um, I think people just need to think long-term. As much as when I was young, I was doing those things, as I said, my, my unbreakable confidence, I knew that somehow, some way this would be nothing to me in the sense of like the expense. Yeah. But I think some young boys is like football is all they have. And if this doesn't work, they're in deep trouble. And what I've also witnessed is when things start to fail, they actually spend more, they go on more nights out. They spend mm. more on clubs, they buy more on cars, clothes, jewelry to kind of compensate for the, the decline in other areas. And then before you know it, they're 30 and bankrupt. And I've also got a few people who have been highly successful who I know who are probably going to fit that pattern also. Yeah. So that coping mechanism of maybe looking for an escape from when things are going wrong, was your coping mechanism then to throw yourself into the business? Yeah, um, I, it was kind of like putting the, my destiny in my hands. As I said, when I was at Doncaster, I think the first season I'd like from right back, 13, 14 assists, but no one talked about it. Like there was no, I was always thinking if this was somebody else, that would have been like, oh, he registered, I think I had most one of the most assists in the league. And no one talked about it and I just realised going back to the Wigan thing as well I was just like well I've always been told facts and numbers don't lie but if someone's not trying to showcase those facts to the wider public no one sees them unless they do deep research so with football it was a case I mean with the business it was a case I need to put this destiny back in my hands because when there's numbers on a screen in business there's no hiding place you know what I mean they're, they're your numbers and if you want to showcase those numbers they are facts whereas if you're a footballer putting out your own stats it looks a bit weird you know what I mean so it was kind of like okay let me put this the destiny back in my hands to control my own fate if football works fantastic gonna break down the ceilings I'm happy if not hopefully again business is probably even to be a successful business after five years is probably harder than to be a footballer at you know football league level to be honest but it was just a case of like I, I can't have someone tell me yes or no I need to be able to put in the work see the direct correlation and results and if it fails, it's also completely my fault. Whereas in football, if, if you succeed, you do need a help in hand. You need a manager to believe in you. You need to play in a good team. You, a lot of things have to go for you. And if you fail, it's still your fault. Do you know what I mean? And obviously a lot of people say, the manager didn't pick me or I played in a crap team. So there was too many moving variables. Sure. So. so you were sort of unfairly judged as a footballer in terms of people judged the external behaviours and made a judgment about you as a person. And you're now in an industry where people are making judgments about your brand and your clothes. So that seems like you've taken control of that. So how would you describe your business to somebody that was looking at it? What are the behaviours or the image that you would want people to to describe your business as? As a as as a model or as what it what as it a does? brand? Um, it's uh, obviously a fashion brand. Um, I'd say we always dictate the trends. Um, high quality at all times so uh, I'm very particular about fabrics how things fit um, price point presentation so very clean image um, minimal uh, affordable and then we release every month so kind of like a, always a new flow of, of product so my favourite business is Zara um, so I, I kind of take Zara's business ethics to a degree as I said before for who's the best how can you make your own you know, stamp and blueprint on that? And that's what I try and do. So constant flow of releases, kind of a, a clean mass market audience um, at affordable prices and good quality. So I've took those fundamentals and tried and kind of remixed them into, into my own identity. And, and in your business as a culture, how would you, how would you describe Manier Devoir away from the customers? What do you want it to be for the people that are with you? Uh, the staff. 
Um, they know, well, if you work with me, you know I'm hard work because like I always say to people, if I, if I said I like it six months ago, don't assume I'll like it in another six months because and, and I, I always do that. Like I'll say, oh, this glass of water is great and then six months, it's, good, it's not good enough no more. So it's a, it's a kind of uh, constant improvement in every single area from from the minimal details to the, the really big things. And, yeah. um, and you massively back your own opinion, right? Because if you're saying that sort of thing, you have to really believe what you're saying. Um, I, I like to listen to everyone for sure. Yeah. I think it's important to get other pe- people's feedback and there's been plenty of times as they've, they've said things I've missed and I'm like, oh, you know, that's a good idea. I didn't think of that. Um, but at the same time, obviously I have to trust my instinct. So when my instinct says something to me like, don't do this, in the past I've actually ignored it because I wanted to listen to people so heavily and I've obviously read in books like, you know, don't be the smartest person in the room and listen to listen to everyone, they might see something you don't. But it actually got to a stage where I was listening too much and got and clouded my own instinct and things wouldn't work. So now I've kind of learned in that equilibrium, I've trust in that in inner voice. And if there's a bit of doubt in my inner voice, then I'll listen to other people. So I've found that balance now. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a high performance culture. I mean, I don't like people working overtime. I think you can get you know everything done in a working day. If you want to do more after working your own time, perfect. That's obviously for for their self development. But um, attention to detail is is my thing, and making sure the little things don't go by. I always say. What got me there in the start is what keeps me there. So whether it's a website tweak or, you know, the smallest of things, I'll pick it up and say we need to improve that. And that, was, that will never change, I don't think. We're, uh, we're nearly out of time. Before we get to the very end and we have some quick fire questions, I'd just like you to do one, one thing for me. We have such a, a wide variety of people that will listen to this podcast. It's, it's big in the football world. So there will be young footballers listening to this conversation right now. I'd love you to just send a message to them based on the experiences that you learned first of all um think long term uh hold off on the you know the the clothes cars and jewelry which you know give you short-term satisfaction because you can have that when you're playing in the premier league every week and you know hopefully playing for your your national team um i think you can always do more so you know when you finish training and you know, you've, you, might have a, you might have a girl coming round or you might want to go shopping, just think, you know, put an extra two hours practicing that cross and shooting, that'll pay off in the long run. Um, and yeah, just have a, have a, oh, this is one thing I didn't do. I didn't think big enough. So my goal was to play in the Premier League and I did that and then that was it, basically. The, my goal was just finished. So whatever your dream is today, if that's to play in the Premier League, have it one step bigger, say, I want to play in the Champions League because then your application on a day-to-day basis completely changes because, you know, being a Premier League footballer and a Champions League footballer is completely different. So aim one step bigger than you think that's physically possible in that moment today. That's your message to a young player. What about your message to someone that wants to do what you've done? They want to set up a brand or a business. They have to make a brave decision. They need to, they need to go for it, but they're not sure whether it's the right time. Is it ever the right time? Based on your approach to life of 100% responsibility and no excuses to people listening to this now who want to do something of their own, what, how would you speak to them for the next minute or so? Um, you mentioned about time and there's never a right time so that's one thing they need to understand firstly is like timing's never perfect you have to make the, the timing perfect so start um i think i said earlier in the podcast just make sure that you have a natural call in don't do it because your friend's doing it or you see someone else do it do it because it's, it's you know something inside your heart or your instinct saying do it um and then don't be scared to fail actually invite the failure when you lose money or make a mistake uh embrace that because that means you can grow um and don't be scared to fail as well, because I feel like people, like, as I said, are so worried about what their friends or family are going to say, or they're going to laugh or say, oh, they didn't, that didn't quite work out. But that's just human nature, unfortunately. I think people are just preying on, not all, but most people are preying on someone's downfall regardless. So you've got to embrace that feeling, because that's what makes you successful. So the quick, quiet, the quick fire questions, Reese. What are the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you have to buy into no excuses um everything's possible dream bigger than you think's possible love that what advice would you give to a teenage reese just starting out 
in football or yeah I think just the 12 year old you if you could speak to the 12 year old you again what's the one thing you would say I'd say aim to be the best in the world um, that's my approach to this day I said before about a footballer if they think they can be a Premier League be a Champions League footballer but if I was to just give it to myself or someone at 12 who's kind of got you know, so much, uh, they're so malleable. I say, aim to be Ronaldo or Messi every single day. That has to be your goal because if you fall short, you're still in a good place. So, your yeah, best in the world mentality. Are you happy? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, I always say to people, if I was to have a day sad, um, I'd be very ungrateful because obviously I'm blessed to be born in, a, in the UK. Um, we've with uh, many opportunities and there's people who would kill for these opportunities so um, I've got my family uh, and obviously I've done okay in life so for me to be sad would be very very ungrateful so yeah absolutely um, I'm very uh, lucky to be in the position I am. Um, how important is legacy to you? That's a good question to be honest because I've gone through phases so I think Legacy in terms of me as a human, I don't really care because this is cynical, but when you die, no one really cares. After It's all said and done anyway. But legacy in terms of people that I can touch in terms of like, maybe they don't directly relate to my name, but whether that's giving opportunity or, you know, helping, you know, underprivileged kids succeed, that's definitely important as I get older. Um, but me, in a, in a selfish aspect, I don't really care about what people think of me once I'm said and done because um, I've, I've, again, studying people's failures. I, I see what they talk, how they talk about Steve Jobs in such a negative light or Elon Musk, the geniuses of the world anyway, who actually changed the world. Nikola Tesla's of the world. They don't care after they're gone. They just take what they give them and then they forget about them. So I think um, as long as my family, the people I love, and then underprivileged people who have no chance to succeed without your help, as long as I can help them, I'm happy. What's your one golden rule for a high-performance life? Complacency kills. Um, I've said before, if I could have one tattoo, which I don't have a tattoo, it would be that, because I think a lot of people in life become successful, but to stay there is one thing, and to do it for fi over five years is excellence, over ten years is genius. Uh, so I think, you know, it's like, if you're complacent, you can get there and you'll fall by the wayside. So you've got to be complacent, consistent, and do the things that you started, uh, do the things that what you did at the start till the, till the end. And I think Ronaldo is the prime example of that till this day, 35 years old. He's, he hasn't changed from when he was 17 years old, and that's where I'll probably play for another two, three years. Um, he's consistent, uh, dedicated, and he still wants to be the best in the world, even though his body's saying no. So that's admirable. Yeah. Longevity is the true barometer of success. Final question. I'm interested to hear the answer to this one. In 10 years' time, where is Manier de Bois? What is it? It won't be in my hands, that's for sure. So whoever decides to buy it, that's their decision. But I can say in two, to, two and a half to five years' time, it will be... Um, it will be a very, very big online fast... Uh, online fashion player I think the revenue will be in excess of 50 the 50 to 100 million mark um, yeah but I don't I always say and I, this is I guess a good tip for I don't overstep my mark I always I always set out to have like a 100 million pound valuation and uh, of course I'll be probably 30 by the time that happens but uh, that was my mark for MDV that was the limit I always said I would take it to and I don't want to overstep that so once that arises then I'll Broaden horizons and see what, what I can if I can join another one percent club. Over money is that how you judge success? No, no turnover is irrelevant. It's profit. So yeah. um, when I say hundred million, it's the percentage of. But is that how you judge success? Profit, or is it about happiness and? Loving? In business, it's purely profit because yeah. why would you be in business if you didn't want to make money? In, in personal life, not at all. I, I always say how much money you have and, the, and and how happy you are don't correlate at all. I think happiness comes from your thoughts, your thoughts in a daily and your perspective of life. Um, and as I said, I, 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 my job as a business owner is to make 
the business money and obviously the staff within it is successful. That's just my job, but in my personal life and um, I like cars, so that was that's almost like a hobby, so to speak. But I don't actually care about those, you know, fancy things. If 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 you can have them, why not? But if I had to, you know, go and live with my mum's house and have a normal car, it'd still be cool because my mind's wealthy, my thoughts are wealthy, and I know that anything I, I want, I can do if I approach it correctly. So, um, and as I said, I've got my family, I've got good friends. Um, I'm, I'm sane. Um, I understand what's important, and that's what makes people happy. Not the money. Money is just a byproduct of, as I said, being excellent. So that's my job. It's as simple as that. Being a business owner is my job. It's not my. It's not my life. It's just my job. Brilliant. I love that point. I, like Camelot many years ago did research on lottery winners and happiness levels, and they found that when you win the lottery, your happiness spikes massively in that short term. But you go back to where you were within twelve months. Absolutely. If you were a cynic, you'll be back to being just a very wealthy cynic. If you yeah. If you're happy, you'll be a wealthy, happy person. And yeah. it seems like you've already discovered that. Yeah, just from reading, as I said, um, I understand that. You, if you're a positive person and you can have a can-do attitude, you, you should be relatively happy and you understand what's real and what's fake and you know what's here to stay and what's not. You'll, you'll be OK. Um, I think you just have to earn you know, a, a good living. It, obviously, London's super expensive, so a good living in London is different to a good living up north. But... I think there was a, another statistic. I think if you earn over a hundred thousand pounds, you're as happy as someone who earns a million pound. I think it's seventy thousand. Seventy thousand is the figure. Uh, seventy thousand dollars. So I don't know what that translates as, but yeah. yeah, you're right. It's it has no discernible impact. It doesn't. A million pounds doesn't make you ten times happier. No, and I think what people don't understand about footballers is that they earn obviously a lot of money, but their standard of living is significantly more. The people they're surrounded with are also significantly wealthy, so they're almost in a delusion land. They don't know what's real and what's not because that's all they know. So when they have to come out of that world, that's why they get depressed because they're like, oh, obviously their other footballer friends have, you know, maybe have gone back at home it's, if they're from abroad or you're not in that environment in the changing room and you, you, you're stuck with real world and real people, and that's extremely hard to deal with and. Um, I think it's the same for people who are business owners and super rich. Their circles change and they become surrounded by people who are all in that kind of the la-la land. And that's why I personally just keep myself... I literally stay indoors most of the time. All my friends are really normal. I've had the same friends since young because I don't want to get caught up. And that's when I start. you think you start to become unhappy. So I think people looking up to footballers, again, they're super, super talented people and, and, and elite athletes, most of them. Um, but they also have... Uh, a big disadvantage in that sense is like they can if you're a normal person so to speak you can date a girl and know that she loves you if you're a footballer can you do that no, probably not um, and also when you get to the top and you have to fall or you've earned, you're earning hundreds of thousands a week and then it goes to zero how do you deal with that whereas if you've got a normal job and you're and you're you know, slowly progressing every single year. You can progress till you're 70 years old or retire as a footballer. It's 30, high, and then straight to the low. So people just need to understand, like, don't don't judge people until you walk, you know, in their shoes. I think that's key. Listen, thank you so much for spending the time to be with us today. I, I think you've really put the message across that even in a successful life like yours, and it is absolutely successful to play for City, to have a professional football career, very few people manage that, and then to go and set up a multi-million pound fashion brand yet it hasn't been necessarily easy and it absolutely hasn't just fallen your way I, I'm so pleased I've met you because looking at your tweets I've sometimes thought to myself like is this all for real like this sort of um, this belief that he has in his own ability and the fact that he is going to get there um, you sometimes get the impression on social media that someone feels they have to put that message out there yeah. but sitting and talking to you for half an hour I absolutely believe that you don't take excuses and you don't make excuses and you take full responsibility for every single part of your life, which I think is a hugely healthy mindset. And when you say many a devour will be a hundred million pound ton of a business in the next five years, it probably will be because you've decided it's so. And I, I get the impression you're the kind of person that will impose your will on that business and will make it successful. So thank you for your time. And I hope that that was really interesting and inspirational for lots of our listeners. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Cheers.